It's wonderful to be here. Um, very happy to be a part of this event. Um, today, uh, I would like to you know, talk a little bit uh, about my entrepreneurial journey. Uh, I'm the founder and CEO of Catalyze Center for Learning. My name is Dr. Rajshree. I'm a biotechnologist turned edupreneur. So people ask me, why did you leave science? You know, why did you leave science and how did you become an entrepreneur? I think it all started when I was doing my PhD. I was at the university and I was a little older than most of the other students because I went back to school after 10 years of uh, industrial career, you know, to get a PhD. And uh, I used to help out a lot of students. As I was taking this role as a teacher to them, what I understood or what came to me very clearly is that no two learner is alike. Every learner is different. And when a teacher is teaching a class of 25 or 30 students, maybe the 5% of the class would actually, you know, absorb what the teacher is teaching. And the rest of them are somewhere there, you know, they grab some things, some things they don't. So this is what led me to form my company way back in 2008, 13 years ago. Catalyze was founded in 2008, but at that time I was busy with many things and it was just growing organically. It was a time way before, you know, the tech revolution. So they were very patchy internet connections. Uh, we are an online organization. We are into edtech, right? So we are an edtech company, which is vertically integrated today. But I'm talking about the 2008 story. Uh, people did not know uh, what Skype was, and Skype was very popular at that time. In 2013, we saw a shift in the customer perception, you know, and people were a lot more comfortable with technology. And in 2016, uh, Catalyze became a private limited company and I started focusing all my energies on building this organization. In 2017, uh, my co-founder and COO, Mr. Sanjay, also joined the organization and since then we have transformed it into a vertically integrated organization. Uh, we have several verticals under Catalyze. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about the verticals and then I will talk about how we have been transforming education through personalization. Our We Teach vertical is after school help. These are all live, interactive, one-on-one -on -one classes with expert faculty. Our We Coach vertical caters to competitive exams like SAT, AP. Under We Teach, which is the after school help, we cater to mainly uh, Cambridge and IB learners, international curricula. Since the pandemic, there has been a shift and our homeschool vertical, which is vSchool, has become very, very popular. So in the homeschool vertical, we support kids for mainstream education, you know, and they appear for Cambridge private candidature. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about how we've been transforming education through personalization. This is our vision. We aim to transform all our learners to achieve more than their aspirations through personalized education. Today, we have transformed 12,000 learners over the last four or five years, and we are present in 40 countries. So what is personalization? Personalization takes into, you know, uh, account the characteristics of the learner, the personality of the learner, talents of the learner, the socioeconomic background, and we customize programs for the learner. It is completely customized. As educators, we all know that there are different kinds of learners, and learners have different learning styles. There are learners who are more auditory, more visual, uh, kinesthetic, 
mathematical or logical. So when we are customizing the programs, we take into account the uh, various learning styles of every learner to personalize it to that particular learner. Catalyze has faculty members of you know, a number of 70, and many of them are hired and trained by us uh, in the international curricula. So I would like to talk a little bit about the four core elements of personalization. Um, I'm not going to read out of the slides. From here on, I'm trying to make this a little experiential. So I would like to share stories about learners and how each of these concepts have been applied to those learners. So the first concept is flexible content and tools. When we are into such a high degree of personalization, it is very important that we keep the content flexible. As I already said, there are different kinds of learners, right? Learning styles vary. So the content needs to vary according to the learning style of the learner. That is why this is called as a flipped class. So in a group class, a teacher teaches the 30 kids the same way. But in a flipped class, the teacher is able to change or fine tune their style of teaching to the learner. That is why these sessions are one on one and they're very, very powerful. The second aspect is targeted instruction. Of course, if you want to see student progress, then your instruction has to be very targeted, right? The third point is data-driven decisions. As educators, you know, uh, the teaching learning process is a lot of interaction, emotional and emotional connect with the student as well. But as educators, sometimes we miss out on the importance of data. And I would like to talk a little bit about a real life, you know, incident where uh, at Catalyze, because we are a data-driven organization, how this data was useful for us during the pandemic. And finally, our goal is to create lifelong learners. So we have to create student ownership and reflection. So these are the core, these are the core principles of personalization. The six core principles. The learner is always at the center. The learner is the center of the learning process. We use technology to vary the classroom to every learner, right? Technology is a very useful tool. So in the case of an auditory learner, you know, we would connect music. Or if it's, it's a, he's a visual learner, then we could play videos. Stretching all learners. In the personalization model, the tutor-student fit becomes very important. So the tutor who is tutoring the learner has to establish that connection. And once the rapport or the connection is established, then the learners always exceed their capacity. This has been our experience and our observations, right? And of course, we know the social and emotional nature of learning. As I said, the emotional connect between the teacher and the student is very important. We all remember teachers in our lives, right? We all remember a great teacher who has made an influence. Recognizing individual differences. No two people are alike. So once we recognize this individual difference, it becomes a very powerful tool to bring into personalization. And finally, we want to have an outcome where there is lifelong learning. So I'm just going to put up these slides. I'm not going to read off these slides. The slides are up there for you to you know, note down whatever you want. And I'm just going to flip it to a little bit more uh, experiential uh, journey from here. So when you look at the flexible content and tools, um, we get a lot of uh, children who want to take sportsmanship or music as mainstream. 
And uh, with such children, you know, especially the musicians, we use music a lot. And we all know that music and math are connected, right? So if you are asking a learner to solve a problem, connecting it with their favorite song, or if the, if the learner is a percussionist, you know, a drummer, then that works really well. It works really well because they're able to connect math to the beats. So this is a little bit summary, you know, a tips about personalized learning, flexible content and tools. Digital content and tools is essential to a well-rounded online learning experience. Reviewing, upgrading of resources and customizing the same to the learner is extremely important. Making the learning experience a two-way street. Now at Catalyze, we have a mantra, you know, happy teaching and happy learning, right? So the teacher is also learning along with the learner. And so many people whom we have hired, educators whom we have hired and who work at Catalyze, one thing that they always come to me and say is that, ma'am, the experience that I've had, the exposure that I have had to the different curricula at Catalyze, I've never had in my entire teaching career, you know? So the reason for that is because we are present in 40 countries. Although Cambridge and IB are our core international curricula, we are also into many country-specific curricula, like the Australian, New Zealand curricula, the K-12 uh, curricula in the US. So for the teacher also, it is a huge expansion. You know, it's an expansion when they teach to the student. Coming to targeted instruction. Um, I would like to share a, a small, um, you know, story about a learner who was adaptive, right? So an adaptive learner is one who can become exceptional given the right nurturing. Uh, this student was a sports person. Uh, he had not gone to formal school after grade eight and he was playing soccer uh, in Europe. Uh, his uh, parents uh, had, uh, you know, uh, turned him into a sports person uh, who was playing soccer in the junior league in Europe. So uh, this boy had a sport injury, you know, and he had to take off for a couple of years uh, to uh, heal himself. And at that time, uh, the parents contacted us and they said that we want him to appear for Cambridge uh, O-Levels, the 10th grade. Uh, we had a huge time crunch because the parents wanted, uh, you know, the child to take the exam uh, within a few months of contacting us, you know, say six or seven months. Anybody who has taught the Cambridge curriculum knows that the 9th and 10th program is integrated and it normally takes about 18 months to two years to get the student ready to appear for the exam. Uh, but the parents were very insistent that they wanted to go ahead with the exam soon. Uh, kudos to all the tutors who handled the student at Catalyze because they really, um, really worked on the learner. And, you know, he was such an intelligent boy. But we could identify the gaps. The gaps were cross-connection, you know. He was very good at remembering concepts but he was not good at cross-connecting the concepts. So we came up with strategies to help him cross-connect the concepts. And of course, he did very well in the O-level exams. Within a span of three months, we got him ready for the computer science course, which was really, really a very steep target for the teacher and for us. Um, now, any parent who contacts me, I tell them I need at least eight months lead time, you know. You can't pressurize me to get the student ready in three months. It was a, it was a huge uphill task for us. But the child has done very well, and now he has finished his 12th grade, and he's on the way to university. So, in this particular scenario, you know, for this student, 
we targeted the instruction to help him connect concepts, right? Because that is an area that he needed, um, you know, uh, he needed, needed uh, help in. So what we did here is identify specific learner needs, target instruction based on the learner, target based on interest, skill level, and learning style of the learner, make targeted instruction a great tool to improvise on performance. So coming to the data-driven decisions. Now, in this particular case, where uh, this child was going to appear for um, uh, O-level exam, that's when the pandemic crashed on us. This was in 2020. And the parents were all geared up, right, to make him uh, appear for the exam as a private candidate, and so were we. But what happened then? Cambridge canceled the exams. They canceled the exams. And the children who went to school, the schools had to provide predictive, predictive grades for the students. Then what do we do for private candidates, you know? So we were really uh, very upset about the whole thing and we were thinking, what do we do now, you know? Because then, um, luckily, I had a relationship with the school uh, where he appeared as, he had registered to appear as a private candidate. And uh, then I spoke to the school management and I said, if we provide a predictive grade for this learner, would you then take it up with Cambridge, you know, upload it along with your other learners as a private candidate, is that possible? Uh, initially the school was resistant, they said, no, the child is not enrolled with us in school and I'm not sure that this is possible. But then later, they did come back to us and say, you know, okay, now we are all in a, in a sticky situation with the pandemic, so why don't you provide a dossier? Provide a dossier to show the evolutionary learning curve of the student, and we would be very happy to upload it into the Cambridge website for evaluation. So that's what we did. And if we did not have the data with us, you know, if we were not able to show uh, evolutionary learning curve for the child, we would not have had the success that we had. Whatever predictive scores we gave to Cambridge, they accepted it as it is. They did not even come back with any queries. And that for us was huge validation as educators, right? So, uh, in fact, uh, even Schools in India were graded 40% lower than the predictive scores that were sent by the school. I know uh, for a fact, you know, many schools were graded lower because they were not able to back their grades with data. While we had recorded everything about the student, the student records were maintained impeccably. And because of that, we were able to show that to Cambridge. And this was a huge feather in our cap. Uh, and, uh, you know, I would say kudos to the team catalyze, the tutors, as well as the coordinators, the academic coordinator, who worked on this to create this path, you know? So tips for data-driven decisions. Train educators and learners to utilize data to make instructional decisions. We can't make decisions about a student if we don't have the data. And that was clearly demonstrated in this situation where we had to provide predictive scores. Learn to identify the most important sources of data in the classroom. Establish a routine for evaluating data. Ensure formative assessments as part of your data routine. Seek to develop a data-driven culture by focusing on individual learner success. Create opportunities for tutors to collaborate with colleagues. So at Catalyze, we do follow all these tips. Finally, student reflection and ownership. Learning is a lifelong process. I strongly believe in it. Uh, if I had not believed in it, I wouldn't have become an entrepreneur. I would not have left science to become an edupreneur, right? So I would like to talk a little bit about the transformation of teachers here rather than students uh, when it comes to uh, reflection and ownership and lifelong learning. We have, a, you know, a, a teacher, a physics teacher, who 
recently retired from Catalyze because she said that I, I can't teach anymore, but she was 75 years old. She did not have any knowledge of technology, you know? And I should, I should tell you this story. She contacted me uh, maybe um, 10 years ago, I would say. Uh, at that time, she was not technologically adept, right? So uh, I told her, ma'am, you are a wealth of knowledge in physics. You have taught in a you know, premier institution in India for more than 40 years. Um, but I cannot you know, take you on at this moment if you're not comfortable with technology because our model is completely online. So she said, okay, Rajshree, no problem. Let me see, you know. And then... Um, we got an inquiry from uh, UAE for uh, two siblings uh, for the Cambridge curriculum. And one of the boys wanted to do mechanics, right? And uh, this is A-levels mechanics. And I, at that point, did not have a tutor who was free who could handle mechanics. Uh, this particular student was coming to us for nearly four or five subjects. Um, so I told my coordinator, you know, if, if we don't have anybody free for mechanics, then I don't want to take on mechanics. I'll take on the other subjects for him and uh, let's, look, let's move ahead. In fact, I was on a car trip traveling from Chennai to Coimbatore. And I was just, I just spoke to my coordinator and I said, you know, I, I, let's just forget about mechanics. Let's move ahead with other subjects. And the next second... I get an email on my phone from this 75-year-old physics teacher, you know, saying, Rajshri, I am good with technology now, and I can take your classes. I almost got, you know, it was like sitting on an electric chair. I got these goosebumps. It was like a, it was like a universal connection moment, you know. And I'm like, my goodness, this moment I just said I'm not, I don't want to take on this inquiry, and I'm getting this. So she was ready with technology, and she taught nearly four or five years of classes for us. And why I'm saying about lifelong learning here is the educators also have to be open for lifelong learning. And she is an example of that. Um, a senior teacher like her, so humble, so willing to learn from her students, and so willing, open to learn new things and new curricula. She told me, Rajshree, I've taught CBSE, I've taught Cambridge, but the variety of curricular exposure that I've got at Catalyze, I've not got anywhere else. And that was a proud moment for me because we are not only creating lifelong learners in the student, we are creating lifelong learners in educators as well. So these are a few tips for reflection and ownership. Encourage the learner to independent learning. Encourage the learner to embrace failure as part of growth. Now kids, it's easy. With adults, it's hard, right? So encourage the learner to prioritize and work effectively. Encourage the learner to reflect and own their progress. So I'd just like to say a few words about transformational stories at Catalyze. Um, this boy, Akash, brilliant boy in eighth grade, wanted to become an astronaut. Uh, you ask him any questions orally, he will answer. He will challenge the educator, challenge the tutor, ask such deep scientific questions that the teacher has to go find answers to answer him. But he would not write. Fortunately or unfortunately, our education system evaluates the student on what is presented on paper during the examination time. It does not give weightage to the knowledge of the learner. So what is presented on the paper is what is evaluated. So the mother was very distraught. She said, I know that my child has a great capacity, but I don't know what to do because he's refusing to write. So I said, okay, then please send your answer sheets. Let me take a look at it. And we had it evaluated by an expert and the opinion was this boy had been forcibly converted from left hand to right hand. So he's a natural left-hander, 
but somebody had forced him to use a hand which he was not comfortable with for writing. So um, we then took this experience to the, to the parent and said that, look, this is the feedback from the expert. And the parent agreed. And she said, yes, he is a natural left-hander. Well, why are you forcing him to write with his right hand? Let him use his natural hand. And uh, you know, after that, the boy excelled because he had the capacity. It's just that he couldn't present uh, himself correctly because of this you know, uh, deviation that had been created from his natural hand to the other hand. So that was one inspiring story. Incredible. Amazing. you got so many stories. I hate to cut you off. We're moving along. we got a couple more speakers, but I want to give you another minute to kind of summarize. It's just one. Amazing. Uh, Go for one, it, girl. One slide. This yeah, is the last sure. one. Thank you. Amazing. Great. Great information today. Uh, Zaid is a 40-year-old learner who has contacted us to uh, appear for the Cambridge exams privately. He wants to appear for the O-levels and the A-levels. Ved is a sports person. He is again playing the league matches in, uh, uh, in Spain. And uh, we are supporting him with Cambridge private candidature for him to clear high school. And Farha. Farha was a learner who came to us, uh, exceptional learner actually. She's an exceptional learner. But, um, she did not want to do engineering. And her father forced her to do engineering. And because of that, she refused to learn. She wanted to do psychology. So we did a lot of you know, counseling to the father, and we turned her around, and she performed exceptionally well. So these are some of the uh, stories at Catalyze. And so we're very proud that we have completed 13 years, 150,000 hours, we are present in 40 countries, and we have transformed 12,000 students. Thank you. Give her a round of applause. Amazing. Dr. Rarashi, thank you so much.